Hello, everyone. This is Mackenzie Rockliffe from the American Tree Farm System slash also the American Forest Foundation. Um, the American Tree Farm System is the largest and oldest sustainable woodland system in America. We work to give our tree farmers the tools they need to be effective stewards of America's natural heritage. And this webinar series has been a cooperative effort between the Tree Farm System, the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, the USDA National Agroforestry Center, the USDA Forest Service, and the Extension Forest Farming Community of Practice. And they actually have been great. They've put us in touch with some great speakers, including today's speaker, Alaire Diamond. Um, and let's see, we can just look at what some of the, the great webinars we've been having in this series. Alaire's is actually not on here, but that's, that's okay. You're already here. Um, <laughs> next up, we have forest cultivated mushrooms and then forest botanicals. So, and also, the rest of these that you see here are on um, the Tree Farm System website. And you can um, see those. I'll put the link in the chat so you can find those. And this webinar um, is available for Society of American Forester Continuing Forestry Education Credit. So if you're interested in that, um, you can watch this webinar today or up to a month from now, and I will submit all those names. If that's not important to you, don't worry. Um, let's see, other important things. Oh, the slides will be sent to you in PDF form as well as a recording after this webinar. So if you, you know, run into connection problems or anything like that, um, not to worry. You'll be sent a recording so you can hear the full discussion. Um, and if you have trouble with audio, uh, there's usually two culprits. Like I, I think someone right now is having bad feedback, and I can actually see that that person has two it's lo they're logged in twice. So if you're logged in twice, um, you will get feedback. So just make sure that you only have one window open. Um, and then also, if you lose audio, it usually is an internet connection issue. So if you refresh your browser, often it works. And um, Eric, you do not need to do anything to submit the CFEs. I submit the CFEs. You just need to make sure that you stay on the line um, for long enough to count. Uh, so you have to watch the whole webinar, and I, and I keep track of that. So you don't have to do anything. You're set. Um, so please keep the questions coming. Um, Alaire, I will be marking all the questions so that she can answer them. You know, She might be doing them as she's going if, if it's pertinent to the current discussion, or she might address them at the end. And, but you should just keep them coming as they, as they occur to you. And I think with that, um, we can move on to the main event. And if, if, you have, if you have other questions, you can just ask them in the chat box, and I'll answer them if they're more logistical questions. So great. Alaire, take it away. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, we have a good diversity of people here from all across the country, and um, I hope that I, I'm way up in the northeastern corner in northern Vermont, um, but hopefully I will have some information that is relevant to all of you. We'll be talking about species that are mostly right around my area, but some of them are at the northern end of their range um, here, and some of them occur kind of broadly. Um, so, so welcome. Um, Art from the forest um, is something that I've been interested in for a long time. Um, I am currently work as a conservation ecologist at the Vermont Land Trust. Um, I live in Jericho, Vermont with my family, and you can see that when I go out in the field, I sometimes take some of my family members with me. The newest one is eight months old. Um, I also have a small ecological consulting business um, that is called Gold Thread Ecological Consulting. And at the end of this webinar, you can see the link to that website, which has a lot of my publications. Some of them I think Mackenzie, two of them I think she sent out to you um, as resources that will give you more in-depth information about some of the species and some of the ideas that we'll be talking about today. So overview of today's webinar, um, I would like to begin by just sharing the diversity of non-timber forest products. And I see from, our, from the question I asked a little while ago about what kinds of things people gathered. Well, first of all, if you gathered things, and then what kinds of things people gathered. It looks like we've got a lot of NTFP um, 
knowledgeable people on this call, on this webinar, which is great. Um, it's a very interesting species I'm seeing that people have gathered. Um, we've got acorns, chestnuts, ginseng, um, medicinal plants, decorative fungi, uh, reishi mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms, um, some interesting ones that sound like they're from the West Coast, um, madrone berries, miner's lettuce, Douglas fir cones. So it's a lot of, a lot of interesting experience in, within this group. Um, so I'm going to be sharing first the diversity of NTFPs, which many of you may be already familiar with. Um, second, the role of the artisan gatherer, um, which is a term that I coined when I was doing my graduate research on um, non-timber forest products. Artists and gatherers, we'll talk about them more in detail um, later on. And talk about the process of reading the landscape to look for um, and collect artisan non-timber forest products. I'm going to share some principles for NTFP management that I have gleaned from my work with artisan gatherers, so with specific um, individuals that I've interviewed and spent time with in the field. And then I want to share, um, I'll be sharing stories about certain species as we move along, um, but I want to share specifically the story of a black ash basket. Um, and black ash is a species that does kind of, I don't know how far west the range of the tree is, but it goes you know, through Minnesota, through sort of the Midwest, down to um, Virginia and Kentucky, and then through the Northeast and into Canada. So with that, um, let's move on. I'll, and so I also wanted to say I'll be sharing some general ideas and principles, but then some, some stories. My hope is that in learning about um, some of the species used for art and craft purposes, um, whether or not these are species that grow near where you live, um, this will help you see your woods or woods that you visit and walk in um, in a new way, or maybe foster connections with people in your community um, that may use or make or, or use craft um, non-timber forest products. So a little overview here of types of NTFPs. Um, I want to start in the upper right corner. So non-timber forest products are, it's a very clunky word <laughs> that I find a little bit awkward, but it, it, I can't think of a better one. Sometimes people call them special forest products, but I like non-timber because it's not, not saying that an NTFP is not a tree, but it's saying that it's a species that is used for something other than timber or wood products. Um, so starting in the upper right, um, many people in this group have said that they've gathered non-timber products for floral greens or decorations. Um, this decorative spray, so I hope you can see the little green arrow that I've got here. Um, if not, start with the upper, the red door in the upper right, and then we're going to move clockwise. Um, a spray made out of um, balsam fir, white pine, ferns, um, different things that can be sort of a holiday decoration. Um, Next picture is of salal, which is a um, species that grows in the Pacific Northwest. Um, paper birch bark um, is a decorative, very, it's actually quite a valuable decorative material. Um, then we get into NTFPs that are used for artisan and craft purposes. And I think that those are, I guess I distinguish those from the floral greens and decorations in that floral greens, and you can just pick and they're a green and you can just put it in a vase and it's decorative as is. Um, artisan and craft species are ones that require a little bit more work to make them into a product that is uh, used in some way. So this the bunch of mushrooms in a basket here are called surprise webcap mushroom, um, Cortinaria semisanguineus, and I'll be sharing more about that species as we move along. <coughs> um, the next tree here um, is a black ash tree. And that is used in basketry. And as I said, we'll be talking about that quite a bit. Um, and then we move into kind of medicinal and spiritual um, species, species that are used in those ways. This is gold thread, um, which is a small evergreen perennial um, herb that grows in the Northeast. And I think it actually grows, it and, and related species actually grow all around the Northern Hemisphere, um, around the globe. I was just actually contacted by someone from a, an art museum um, looking to get some specimens of that um, for, to match with a, a Japanese dye product. So they, wanted to, they, they couldn't get the Japanese version, so they thought if they could get the version in, um, that grows in Vermont, then that would be close enough. So gold thread is used 
as a dye. Um, it's got yellow roots, but it's also used as medicinally. Um, next plant here is American ginseng, very valuable NTFP. Um, hemlock reishi mushroom. So I saw that somebody, at least one person, has gathered reishi. This is um, this species grows on hemlock trees, but there is also are also versions of reishi that grow in other um, parts of the world. And then finally, there's a whole group of non-timber forest products that are edible. And I think many people, um, I would say that almost every person that's ever walked in the woods and picked a raspberry and eaten it has engaged in non-timber forest product gathering <laughs> and, um, and use. So here we have elderberries, which are edible, can be made into preserves. Um, they're medicinally used as well, um, high in vitamin C. Um, this is tap here is a tap for maple sap. So in the northeast where I live, maple syrup is a huge commodity. Um, it's a non-timber forest product, and it's quite a big part of our local economy, and it's a product we export around the world. And then um, finally, here's a, an edible mushroom. So this is a chanterelle that is uh, quite valuable and appreciated by gourmet cooks and, and um, eaters. So I want to distinguish here about as we talk about artists and non-timber forest products, I just think there's an important distinction to make um, before we get too far into it. And that distinction is between products that are valuable in and of themselves. So right here, there's a, um, a person that I know who lives in the, the northern Vermont area gathering chanterelle mushrooms. These are valuable. He can pick these, he can go home and cook them up and eat them, or he can sell them to a store and get some money. Just in and of themselves, they have value. Um, I'm sure we can all name things that are similar, blueberries, um, ginseng. So species that are just valuable in and of themselves that are almost have a market. Um, here's some blueberries. But then the products that I'm interested in um, are more what I think of as value added. So this is a picture of me on the right with um, my sister-in-law and my mother-in-law at our family's farm um, in southern Vermont. It's a Christmas tree farm. It's, it's, it's in the American tree farm system. And for years, we, my father-in-law is trimming the trees, and then we will take the discarded um, boughs and gather other things in the woods and tie them together. And it's quite a simple process. There's not a lot of um, expert skill <laughs> required, um, but these are a way that we can make some extra money. Um, you know, we can sell these for $15 a piece, and a tree that's been pruned and maintained for 10 years can sell for 25. And so it's actually quite a, an easy way to make, um, to add value to, to, that, um, to that product or to, to that process of growing Christmas trees. And I know that you know, some of you are tree farmers and maybe have Christmas trees yourself. Um, so value added products are ones where you can you get the material, but there's some additional processing needed. And so in this case, very simple processing, literally tying the pieces together. Um, but in other cases, it's, quite, it's a lot more complex, as in this example. So where I live, again, <laughs> um, this is kind of a common sight. You, walking in the woods where, that, imagine 100 years ago, this area was, in this picture, was not actually forested. It was actually an open field with maybe one tree in it. And that tree is this, this large sugar maple that's right in the center. In New England, um, we have a history of land clearing followed by for agriculture, followed by farm abandonment, and then forests growing back. Um, our, our forests, we have more forests in Vermont and in um, New England today than we did 100 years ago, and a lot of the forests look like this. So some older trees that you can tell by the branches that they, they started out in an open area, surrounded by much younger trees. This, this large maple is, is not valuable for timber. It's got a lot of rot. It's got branches falling off. It doesn't have a long straight section. Um, but it is valuable from an NTFP perspective. Um, it's valuable if you're willing to do quite a bit of work and, and add value um, to it. And so you may be asking, well, how can you add value to a tree like that by knowing which part of it might have some interesting fungal growth or some that can lead to figuring in the wood, um, which parts of it might have interesting grain because the wood grew in a twisty way. Um, 
need, you need to do quite a bit of work to get the value out of this, out of a tree like that. Um, you need to cut it down or cut off a part of it, a branch. You need to have a lathe. You need to have the skills um, to be able to use the lathe. But you can take a chunk of an old tree, such as that one, that's partly rotten and not good for timber at all, um, and make gorgeous bowls that can sell for $75, $80, $100 um, a piece. But that requires a practiced eye, and it requires um, a lot of hard work and some, some other you know, tools and investments. So I think this is a, a kind of an extreme example of adding value because you do need so many um, other inputs to do that, but I think it, it's a good example. Um, I want to stop and just address a couple of the questions that people have asked so far. Um, I have got a question to discuss possibilities in the southern pine forest. I think that I will be talking about pine forest a little bit later. Um, so hopefully that that will give you something to apply in your area. Um, question about permaculture and asking if I'm familiar with permaculture. And yes, I think that I am familiar with permaculture. And I think that there are a lot of connections between um, NTFP gathering and permaculture. Um, there is a distinction, and we can get into that a little bit later, about a, a distinction that I see between going out in the woods and just literally looking for something and picking it and, and producing something out of that. The difference between that and actually actively managing for that um, product, and I think both of those are, you know, they're, they're similar to each other, but, they're, but I do see a distinction. So I, I see that in some ways many people um, do manage non-timber forest product species. We'll talk a little bit about how people do that, like with willow, um, with red osier dogwood, um, with berries and edibles, and how that can be. I, I do actually see that as a, a type of permaculture. Um, the question about how do you spell reishi? It's R-E-I-S-H-I. And then another question on, is there a value in selling the raw material, such as a cut section of a tree for craft makers? Um, well, I think that, that it, that's depends, really depends on kind of very localized uh, circumstances. One interesting thing I find about non-timber forest products is that with the exception of a few like maple syrup that has, like I said, an international kind of, um, there's an international market for it and it's, there's distributors and there's a whole, the whole kind of business behind that. Um, most NTFPs, the, the uh, financial transactions are very localized, and they're they're usually not recorded by you know part of our GMP or anything like that, um, GDP. Um, so there is a value. Um, my father-in-law does sell cut boughs of his balsam fir Christmas trees to wreath makers. Um, he gets us. I think he sells it by the pound or by the ton um, to them. So it doesn't. And then cut sections of trees. Um, just in my personal interactions with bowl turners, I'm assuming you're, at, you're responding to the slide here that shows the bowl turner. Uh, most, I don't know. I guess it, I guess it depends on the individual. I don't. I'm not aware of a lot of turners who actually will buy like a a branch of a tree to turn into bowls. Usually, what happens is someone cuts a tree. They have kind of this misshapen, huge, partly rotten piece and they'll contact their a bowl turner that they know and that person will come and pick it up. So in a way the turner is providing a service by getting that wood off of the um, off of the landowner's land and um, finding a use for it. Um, I'm sure that there are if you if someone found a really beautiful like tiger maple piece or something, I think that there is value in that as well. Um, but again, it's on a really local level. <clears throat> So I want to also just say that artists and NTFPs have a long history. Um, they range from very, there are long traditions in some cases. So this picture on the left is a, from the Smithsonian Institution. It's a Native American um, encampment from the late 1800s um, in New York of people making black ash baskets. And there was a, a tradition of family groups who actually traveled through sort of resort areas in northern New England and New York and made baskets and sold them to tourists in the summer. Um, and the, the basket styles, you can see the two baskets in front here. Um, they are the traditional pack basket here on the right and then more of like a cargo basket in the middle. Um, 
those are traditional styles. They're still made today. They're still very valuable today. So these are there's a long tradition of people making these these baskets, which come directly um, you know from the black ash tree. But on the other hand, you can see this picture on the right is a hat that is made entirely from wool that's been dyed with different kinds of mushrooms, different species of mushrooms, um, by a woman named Ann Williams who lives in Down East Maine. And you know, I think no one would argue that that's an absolutely unique item, that you're not going to just find that <laughs> um, on every street corner. Um, it's to, to know that mushrooms can make dyes, to gather them, to actually make the dyes with them, and then dye the wool, and then make the hat. Um, that's a pretty specialized and unique um, process and practice. So tradition, traditional and very contemporary. Um, I want to share a few more examples of materials that are artisan materials that are NTFP based, starting again in the upper right, um, a basket made from willow twigs. Um, there might be some red osier dogwood in there too, but I think it's mostly willow. Um, these are, this was made by um, Tom Cady, who uh, is, lives in Vermont. Um, he's got Abenaki um, Native American heritage. This picture on the right um, is a, a selection of baskets. The basket that the arrow is on is made of paper birch. Um, then there's other baskets made of black ash, this one and this one. And here's another birch basket. And this one I think may have some Wheat grass, or it might be made of something that's not um, not a native um, basket material. But paper birch and black ash and sweet grass are the three main basket um, making materials that I um, have, have studied. The two pictures on the bottom are textiles that have been woven by Kate Smith, who is a, a textile artist in central Vermont. She grows a lot of her own plants for natural dyes. She gathers some native plants. The ones that she grows tend to be non-native, um, like indigo and weld, which are not native to the Northeast. Um, she buys some dyes, some natural materials, and, and does the dyeing, and then she gathers other uh, materials, specifically black walnut. Um, and I will uh, talk more about that later. I think this sort of dark greenish-brown stripe here that I'm putting the arrows on is, is made with black walnut dye. On the uh, kind of 9 o'clock position here is a tiny um, little box made of paper birch bark. Um, and then the top is a piece of paper birch, and this is a little piece of deer hide um, for the handle. And then in the upper left is a skein of yarn that has been dyed with lichen, uh, umbilicaria lichen, which is sometimes called a rock tripe in, um, <coughs> rock tripe in uh, its common name. And this, is, this species of lichen actually, there's relative to that species that are throughout the world, but it's actually really important for some traditional Scottish plaids. So there have been long traditions in Scotland of gathering these lichens and, and making plaids um, for them so that certain families would have this kind of their signature plaid. So I, I hinted at this a little bit um, earlier, but when I started doing my, um, my research into this topic of, art, of artisan non-timber forest products, I was really interested in understanding the ecological knowledge of artisans who use non-timber forest products in their work, in their craft, um, particularly basketry and natural dyes. And I chose basketry and natural dyes because these are, um, there's multiple species um, that are used for each. And there are obviously many other ways that you can use non-timber forest products for art. But these are the specific ones I'll be talking about. Um, so in my research, I spent about a year um, seeking these people out, um, gathering their stories, traveling around New England, and accompanying them to their gathering sites. Sometimes they weren't willing to show me their gathering sites. Um, and in that case, <laughs> I just talked with them and tried to, to glean information from them um, just in conversation. And um, I wanted to find out how their expert knowledge took them from a broad, patchwork landscape such as this one um, with fields and mountains and different kinds of forest, how their knowledge kind of helped them to zoom in to places that might be a little bit more interesting. Um, on this slide you can see that there are arrows pointing to the river, um, this little water course that comes down to maybe a wetland. And then going from that 
middle point to a specific place on the ground that might have some species and materials that they would want to use. Um, so you can see right over here some shrubs, and those shrubs are uh, are willow. And so those willow branches can be woven into a basket like this. This is the one I showed before. So how do you go from looking at that larger landscape down to literally the species and the specimen level? Um, because not every willow plant is going to have the, the qualities needed to produce a basket. So how do you get there? Um, you get there through expert knowledge. And I just want to stop here and introduce some of the, the people who are the artisans um, that, that really um, were invaluable to me in my work. And when I, when I sought these people out, I was looking, I should say, I was looking for people that had decades, hopefully, of experience um, with their craft that were considered experts by their community. So whether it was they were considered master teachers or master artisans, um, they often were featured in sort of regional to national level um, magazines and shows, craft shows. They were sought out, um, and they they made most some or, or some to most to all actually of their living from their craft. And I was very fortunate to have found quite a few. So let me introduce you to some of them. Um, this woman here in the upper upper right um, is Susan Carpenter. She lives in central Vermont, and she is shown next to a, a black ash tree that she's marked as one that's high quality enough for uh, making baskets. Um, this is Stephen Zay, who lives in western Maine. He is a master black ash basket maker as well. Um, this woman here um, is Judy Dow. She is lives just down the road from me in Essex, Vermont. She is just an incredible historian. Um, teacher and basket maker. Um, she has Abenaki Native American heritage and just brings a lot of um, a lot of insight about those traditions into her work as well. Um, Tom Cady, who I introduced before, he made the basket that I showed on the previous slide. Um, he's a he's just a master um, basket maker as well as he is he just is quite knowledgeable about edible NTFPs as well. He's shown here just sharing some interesting information about edible mushrooms on a field walk that we did. Um, this woman here is um, that someone had asked about pine forests earlier, and this is I think the place that I would go with that is um, Carlene Skeffington. This is she's shown here in a pine woods pine plantation in southern New Hampshire, and she's looking for dye mushrooms. Um, dye mushrooms tend to associate more with um, coniferous trees than with deciduous trees. Um, so I, I would say pine forests are really places to go if you are looking for mushrooms, edible, um, medicinal, or, or dye mushrooms. So she's pointing out a, um, a surprise webcat mushroom in that picture. <clears throat> um, this guy right here at about 9 o'clock is Steve Katzos, and he and his wife Joanne live in southwestern Massachusetts, and they actually together make their entire living from Joanne's uh, black ash baskets. She makes incredibly detailed um, baskets. He is the person that goes out and collects the wood, um, does, does a lot of the processing, and then she is the weaver. And so together they're this amazing team who have really crafted a, a livelihood for themselves out of that work. Um, and then this is Suzanne Grossjean up in the upper left. She is a, a fiber artist in um, down east Maine, and she gathers and grows a lot of incredible plants that she uses to make beautiful uh, knitted and woven uh, products. So when I started before, and I want to just go back here a minute to this slide. Can I do that? Let's see, I think I need to just zoom back a couple of slides. Sorry for the <laughs> hiccup there. Um, I'm interested in how a person like Stephen can go from this ash tree to this absolutely incredible piece of art, or um, how, how a, you can go take a tiny brown mushroom that you might just walk by and not think anything of it and use your knowledge to make incredible dyes from it. So this is the surprise webcat mushroom. This is wool that's been dyed from that. And um, Anne is here shown collecting some mushrooms, not that particular one, but some of them. So how do you go from tree to basket, um, from mushroom to wool?
you get there through expert knowledge. And my work, once I had identified these people, walked in the field with them, tried to understand, um, tried to understand what, what they thought about when they were walking in the woods or walking through their land and, and looking for the materials that they needed, what I came away with was a set of principles for identifying certain parts of the landscape. And I'm going to go through that right now. I'm going to go take this generalized landscape, which is kind of a common one for Vermont. Um, you know, we've got a, a steep hill, we've got cliffs, we've got woods below the cliffs, there's an area of wetlands, um, there's a road, there's a field, um, there's a plantation. So a landscape that has all of these kind of features, how do you decide where to go and what do you look for in each part of it? So I'm going to go through this um, to show you some parts of that landscape. <coughs> It's fascinating to me how artisan gatherer knowledge really encompasses detailed biogeographical um, and biogeophysical characteristics of gathering sites. So when someone like Carlene is walking through a pine plantation, um, an open light forest floor, she is she might not know it, um, but she is evaluating and she's responding to information that's out there about soils, about possibly about bedrock, about hydrology, um, about elevation or slope. Um, forest type and herbaceous ground cover, and about land use history. So she is choosing to go to a plantation, um, and I say plantation because in northern New England, plantations are the places that are kind of open and light like this, and I, I know in other parts of the country, there are forests that look the way that some plantations <laughs> do here. They're, they're op more open, they're more light, they don't have a lot of herbaceous vegetation on the forest floor, but in our area, we do get so much rain um, that natural forests tend to be a little more, um, just have more plant cover in them. Um, so Carlene is responding to, she's going to a plantation where there are coniferous trees that have been planted a certain spacing apart. There's a certain amount of light coming down to the forest floor. There is, um, the trees themselves produce needles that acidify the soil, so it's more acidic kind of place. Um, that is hospitable to mushrooms. And so, like I said earlier, many mushrooms associate with coniferous, with the roots of coniferous trees. So even if you see one, you know, a few feet out from a tree, it's it probably, the mushroom organism itself is probably connected to that tree and associated with the roots of that tree, um, even though you, don't, you might not see a direct connection, like it's not growing right on the wood. Um, so in open and light forest floors, the dye mushrooms and edible mushrooms to some extent are what the artisan material that, that people would look for in that kind of area. So there's a, a surprise webcap mushroom. There's also a mushroom called Dyer's polypore that's, um, you can tell by its name, Dyer's polypore that's used for, for natural dyes, um, for a yellow dye. Another place that people often gravitated to, towards um, are woods roads or forest gaps um, and hedges. Um, one thing that I find interesting about this is that the ecological knowledge of these artisans is also tied to sort of the ease of access to the material. So if you think about it, you know, walking along a, a woods road um, or a hedgerow is a lot easier than scrambling up a steep, wet um, bank or a steep hillside or climbing over a cliff and scrambling around rocks. And luckily, there are a lot of very useful materials and plants that grow along um, those places. So mostly what people um, talked about gathering along woods roads and in forest gaps are edible berries that can also be used for dyes. Um, elderberry, which is shown in the photo there, nannyberry, um, and highbush cranberry, which are both viburnums, uh, Virginia creeper, and staghorn sumac. And staghorn sumac is used um, for edible. Uh, well, more, I guess more for a drink. <laughs> you can make sort of a, a lemonade, sort of iced tea kind of drink out of staghorn sumac, but also um, different parts of it are used for a natural dye, and that's something that actually um, is used in all parts of the country. I think that sumac, um, different species of sumac occur throughout the country and can be really powerful dye. Um, I think it's hard to get a natural dye that produces black, but sumac roots can produce something that's very, very close to black. Um, obviously, that requires digging up the roots, which can damage the tree, obviously, um, but, it's, but it can be a, a very powerful. But the, the bark and the twigs also can be used as a dye to produce a yellow. 
<clears throat> um, I see a question about basket makers preparing for the arrival of emerald, emerald ash borer, um, and I am definitely going to address that later on. So thank you for that question. Um, and also just a comment that it would be great if we could get artisans to do a webinar on their craft. Um, fungi used in dyeing silk, wool, and can they dye cotton? Um, so I should just say I think it's maybe assumed that when I came on and said I'm an ecologist that I'm not um, a fiber artist or a basket maker. I've made one basket <laughs> in my life. Um, but I can, I can respond to that a little bit, um, just what I've learned about natural dyeing. So silk, wool, and cotton are all natural fibers. Um, they, it's easier, from what I gather from people that I've talked with, it's easier to dye animal-based fibers like the, the silk or the wool than to dye cotton. But the dyeing, um, the, the dye source, like the species um, of plant or mushroom or lichen, is not as important as the other material, the mordant, which is um, like a, it, the other chemicals that can be added to the dye bath to make the, fi the dye uh, pigment actually stick to the fiber. So mordants can range from like really mild ones like vinegar um, or alum up to kind of, kind of more toxic materials like chrome and tin. So I think that just based on the, you can look in, there's a lot of books, great books out there about natural dyes that talk about what mordants you need to make a dye bath for um, based on the material that you want to dye, if it's cotton versus wool or silk. Um, see a question, what is Virginia creeper used for? Um, apparently Virginia creeper is, can be, is, is edible um, and can also be used as a dye, I believe. But I think that what I, um, I'm writing here is that it's that it can be an edible plant. That wasn't one I spent a lot of time on. Um, got a question. How do you feel about using Google Earth to target specific areas of forest for non-timber products? I love Google Earth. Um, I use it. I, um, I use aerial photography, I guess. And so Google Earth, Google Earth is a great place to access very high quality aerial photographs. Um, Bing is another place that has that has their own imagery. Um, for aerial photographs. You can learn a lot about a landscape by looking at Google Earth or looking at Bing, um, you, looking at those aerial photos. You can, with practice, you can learn to recognize different types of trees, um, cedar versus white pine from an aerial photograph. And you can look at, you can even recognize certain, distinguish certain kinds of hardwoods from each other, like oak versus maple, depending on the time of year that the photo was taken. Um, and you can definitely see based on the texture of the landscape, you can see um, if a place is a wetland, if it's a forested wetland versus an open wetland. And you can get a lot of information from that. Um, I use Google Earth a lot in my job. Um, and, uh, and I definitely recommend using that. Um, it's, a, it's a fabulous tool. Um, and they have a lot of other resources too that, where you can actually put points down and make maps and things like that. Um, just got a warning, watch out, Virginia creeper. It looks like poison ivy. Yeah, it, it can resemble poison ivy. Um, usually, uh, Virginia creeper has a compound, they both are compound leaves. Poison ivy has uh, three leaflets, and Virginia creeper usually has five, but the leaflets do resemble each other. So, yes, keep an eye out. And poison ivy is also a vine, um, which can grow up trees. <clears throat> okay, so moving on to other parts of the landscape that artists and gatherers kind of pick out when they go out to look for the materials that they need. Stone walls. Um, this, is, this may be more unique to kind of eastern United States than, than the west. Um, we have a lot of stone walls based on you know, that land use history I talked about with our um, with, uh, agriculture and then abandoned agriculture. But along stone walls, tend to find a lot of nut-bearing trees. And I think that this actually has a lot to do with the fact that squirrels tend to cache nuts along them <laughs> and then the trees grow. Um, but we also have trees that don't qu do quite as well in our, uh, in our natural forests. Um, prefer stone walls because they tend to get a little more light. And so you can find butternut trees, black walnut trees, um, American basswood or American elm trees um, along stone walls. This photograph shows a black walnut tree that's along a fence, so similar kind of idea as a stone wall, um, in central Vermont. And I should say that black walnuts natural range, this is north of where black walnut occurs naturally. Um, it will grow if someone plants it. So 
artisan gatherers in northern New England actually who use black walnut can usually point to one specific tree that they can that they return to year after year after year to gather um, their nuts. If you're from further south, um, they you know butternut and black walnut are much more common and have actually a, quite a long history of, of use. I've heard somewhere that Confederate soldiers were once called butternuts because their uniforms um, were dyed with butternuts at a certain point in the Civil War. Okay, streams are another, another kind of natural place in the landscape to look for NTFPs. Um, the willows, the red osier dogwood, so basket um, weaving shrubs, um, goldenrod, which is a great natural dye plant, American elm, and black ash can occur along streams. And forested wetlands and swamps. These sometimes are right along streams, sometimes they're not. They're in their own little basins. Um, black ash is a is very spe site specific tree, um, at least where I am. It's very closely associated with forested wetlands that are fed by groundwater um, as opposed to rainwater. Um, so they, they tend to be a, in a little bit more um, basic soil rather than acidic, um, acidic conditions. Um, so forested wetlands are where I would go to definitely to look for black ash. You can see that this tree, um, see all the ferns around it, You're in, we're in a very wet place here in this photo, um, but see the moss at the base of the tree just indicates that there are, there's, it's got wet feet is what a lot of, a lot of artisans told me about that species. Um, so let's see, rocky cliffs and slopes are places where the dye lichens like the umbilicaria um, can occur. These can be picked out from a distance by, you know, if you can't see the cliff itself, sometimes there's a band of coniferous trees on the top of the cliff where there's very shallow soil and then deciduous trees below. So that can be a, a little bit of a clue if you're looking on Google Earth or you're looking kind of across a larger landscape to try to pick out a cliff. And then cool slopes and hollows um, are where a lot of people told me they go to harvest um, paper birch. Um, high up um, is where the higher quality trees that have bark that people want um, are, are higher in elevation, at least in my area. Um, I should say that while we We'll talk about paper birch a little bit more in a few minutes, but paper birch is uh, it's more sustainable to harvest paper birch than you may think. When I first started out with this work, I thought, okay, you take the bark off a tree, it's going to kill the tree. But in fact, um, taking the, the amount of bark that a basket maker or someone needs to, to make an artist product actually can, the bark can grow back. It can regenerate on the tree if it's harvested at the right time of year and the right um, way. So using that landscape knowledge is the way that somebody can go from this sort of nondescript looking forested wetland, little sloping area, um, black ash trees here, to literally making a basket that Martha Stewart, this is Martha Stewart, has bought and is and wears around. Um, Stephen Zay, one of the, the basket makers I showed earlier, um, one of his loyal customers is Martha Stewart. And so it's you know, it's, it's interesting to me to think about how he can take his expert knowledge, go out in the woods, um, harvest a tree, make a basket, and then it ends up in the hands of Martha Stewart. So I want to share now a few principles for, um, for landowners um, because there are some, some there's a lot of potential for non-timber forest products for landowners. It's not necessarily something that you can just go out and harvest and, and there's a ready market for it. Um, it takes a little more thought and a little bit more relationship building, but there's a lot of interesting and very enriching um, possibilities. So just here again, um, black ash swamp in the upper right. Here's a, a red pine plantation in the lower right. A riverbank with willow shrubs in the lower left and that black walnut tree. <coughs> so. I should back up and say that for some NTFPs, there is a ready market. Um, for paper birch bark, there, there's a market for paper birch bark. It's used, it's very popular as a decorative material. Um, think about like an Adirondack camp um, that I'll forward ahead here to just show you an example. Um, decorative mirrors with paper birch, this beautiful looking desk. Um, these, there is a market for this um, and this a small forestry company in southern Vermont and New Hampshire has actually decided to try to get into that market. And so they've trained um, their staff to 
go out at the right time um, when they're going to be harvesting birch trees from a landowner's property. They'll go out before the trees are harvested and harvest the bark from the trees. Um, if you do it in the right way and at the right time it comes off very easily, you can see that this, um, this man is just peeling off these large sheets of bark, um, take it out of the woods on, on their ATV, and then they actually have told me that, they, that the landowner will, will get as much money from the bark of the tree as they will from the timber of that tree. So there is quite a, a market for paper birch bark um, if it comes from you know, straight, tall trees, um, wide, big trees, so you can get a good, a good sheet of bark without a lot of blemishes on it. And like I said, it's, it's um, used in a lot of craft purposes as well, traditional and more modern. Um, <clears throat> One thing that I find that's interesting um, about materials that, that might have that market is that to, someone asked earlier about permaculture, and I said, you know, I, I see the distinction about managing for a product that's permaculture, whereas just going out and gathering something is more, of a, is more about just gathering. Um, one, thing, one theme that arose for me when I started looking into NTFPs used for artisan purposes as well as for edible and medicinal purposes is that there is a long tradition of managing those species. And in many cases, the management mimics the natural disturbance. So I want to start with a, let's see, where should we start here? Um, this is a shrub. And think of, think of it as like a willow or a dogwood shrub. Think of it as willow because I think that's pretty common. Um, that if willow shrubs tend to grow along rivers, they tend to grow in places where in in, at least in the Northeast, we get a lot. We have winter. We have ice. Um, ice scours riverbanks. It shears off the tops of shrubs that then will grow back the next year. Um, for a basket maker, they will want only the um, the current year's growth of a willow shrub. So it's straight. There's no side branches, and it's very flexible and supple. So to get that current year's growth, you you need to be pruning back the tree each year so it can grow um, long straight shoots. So that, that growth can be, or that, I guess that form of the plant can be produced by cutting, um, by management, or by natural disturbance, by that ice scour that, that naturally occurs um, with willows. So in this case, you can see that a um, harvested shrub sort of looks kind of small and stubby. It will grow back in these long straight shoots um, that are useful for basketry. Um, if it is then not managed, if it's not cut back, then those shoots will grow um, side shoots. There might be insects and disease that come in, lichens and mosses. And there's nothing wrong with this adult shrub over here. Um, it's just that it is not suitable for basket material. Um, and that it, it may eventually, it'll eventually senesce um, and die just naturally like any plant would if it's left to its own devices and not disturbed. Um, if it's disturbed naturally, um, it can be, it can will grow again um, into material that can be used as in baskets. And this is a photo. Um, MCAT Anderson is a researcher out in California who has just done some really amazing work about Native American management of non-timber species a lot. She focuses a lot on basket species, but also edibles and medicinals. And she shows uh, redbud, which occurs out there, um, managed material right here versus an unmanaged branch and I think that the, the obviously the form of those two branches is quite <laughs> quite different. Um, you would not want to make a basket out of this one on the top. <clears throat> so another principle um, for non-timber forest product management or even location is finding and utilizing very small specific sites. So it's different, um, you know, if you're if you're trying to grow pine trees, Pine trees can occur across a wide range of, of microhabitats. They can grow on hills, they can grow in flat places, they can grow near streams. Um, if you're looking for a blood red web cap mushroom, which is a very tiny um, mushroom that produces a beautiful red dye, it only grows in very, very specific places. Um, you know, the difference of a few inches of elevation between a, above a stream might make the difference of whether or not that mushroom occurs there. Um, this place that I'm showing you on this slide is about one square foot um, in area, and it's a place where a um, Karen Whitshirk, who is a mushroom dyer um, from Massachusetts, 
told me she collects blood red webcap mushrooms there every year. She doesn't find them. She finds them right here where my arrows are. She does not find them up here. She doesn't find them over here, but just right there. So it requires a different level of understanding the land, <laughs> I think. Um, maintaining specimens and sites. So this is a willow shrub um, that, has, that has been maintained, I don't think actually for basketry, but it's, it could easily produce basket material. That a lot of this material could be used for baskets. Um, as I showed in those other slides, those slides a couple, the diagrams a few minutes ago, um, it's important to maintain specimens and sites in some cases, like with the basket shrubs. You can't really produce a basket if the, if the plant hasn't been maintained. Um, and this is a, another photo of, of some folks gathering dye lichens. Um, someone had asked me a question on, um, a minute ago about, or put a question up about, uh, <clears throat> and I know we have just a few minutes left, um, a question about the impact of foraging on the, the populations. And these folks say, you know, we never take more than 25% of the material that's there at, at a given time, and then we let it regenerate. And understanding the life cycles of the plants or the, or the lichens is important um, in gathering. These are the, the lichens. Um, that's the yarn that can be made from them. Beautiful colors. Um, understanding the seasonality of harvest. So to harvest paper birch bark, you are, um, can only do it at certain times of the year. There's two times of the year you can harvest it, depending on um, the quality of the bark that you want. It, it looks different whether you harvest it in the winter or in the early summer. Um, this you know, surprise webcap mushroom only occurs at certain times in the summer um, after a, cer a certain number of days after a certain level of rain. So people who really know their mushrooms know when to go out and look for surprise webcap mushroom. But if you look for it, you can make beautiful salmon colored um, dye. Um, this is a hemlock reishi mushroom. And I put this on here just to, to highlight that this is, these mushrooms are quite old. They have growth rings just like trees, um, you know, decades old. Understanding that each of these species has its own time frame for growth, and so over harvesting can definitely um, you can you can wipe out you know decades of growth in one um, one fell swoop. So just understanding that, and then understanding the appropriate quality for use. These are two black ash trees that are growing within 100 feet of each other um, on Stephen Zay's land in Maine. Um, this one is bad quality for baskets. This one is very good quality for baskets. Um, has this one's got this not this blemish here. Um, the furrows are very deep. This one is has very consistent bark um, on the right. Doesn't have deep furrows. It's kind of flaking off, showing that it grows. Um, it's growing more quickly. So understanding that helped that different qualities um, exist from tree to tree helps you to avoid a lot of wasted effort and a lot of just waste. Um, cutting down a tree that wouldn't be use, useful um, is, is just uh, not good practice. <clears throat> um, people also understand that certain indicator species can, show, can, can grow near high quality trees. So this is a black ash leaf in the center um, with foam flower and false hellebore, which are two species that artisan gatherers frequently told me they think about um, seeing when they're looking at a high quality black ash. Complementing other management, um, willow can be used for riparian buffers, um, it's, and then it can be harvested for baskets. It's a great way to, to kind of do two things at once. And then giving back is a principle that a lot of gatherers talk to me about. Um, Tom Katie and Judy Dow both talked about this idea of burying the first basket that you make, especially if it's a willow basket, because that basket will actually grow. Um, you know, the, the if it's if the wood isn't too old, um, it will actually grow into more willow trees. And so giving back that first piece of work will then yield great results um, in the future, sort of spiritually, but maybe physically as well. <laughs> um, and then know your potential market. You know, if you're harvesting chanterelles, you can go to down the street to your gourmet restaurant and sell to them. If you're harvesting a black ash tree, probably no one's going to want to buy that tree. But if you can go through the steps of measuring the tree, um, evaluating the specimen, and I'll go through the story very quickly here. Um, harvesting the specimen, timing the, specimen, the harvest right, storing the material in the appropriate way, processing that tree, um, pounding the log to release the growth rings and peeling those off, 
if you do all of these steps, peel, here's um, peeling the, the growth rings off and then further processing into very thin strips for basket making, weaving that basket. And these are a couple different people. This is Irene Ames in northeastern Vermont who makes something called a Sweetser basket. And that was Susan Carpenter, the last photo there. Weaving the basket, um, you know, to having your own individual style that you're using. Um, if you do those things, then you can get quite a bit of um, response. There's th those materials can be very valuable. Um, Joanne and Steve Katzos put their kids through college with black ash baskets, but if they just tried to sell black ash trees, um, probably would not have done so well at all. It all begins with looking at the landscape with expert eyes, um, and I want to end with saying that next steps, um, you know, people talked about Google Earth. I produced this map for a landowner as part of my um, my research project with the Vermont Land Trust. I mapped basket species locations on their property, um, wrote a report about ideas for management, ways that they could um, increase the quality of those species or increase the number of, of um, specimens that grew. And that's one, you know, one option. Another is just to get out in your community and start talking to people who might um, be using and interested in, in um, these products. So I want to thank you all for coming again. And um, some thanks for the people who took photos that I've used. Um, if you are interested in learning more about some of the work that I've done or some of the people that I interviewed, um, check out my website, goldthreadvermont.com. And I, um, let's see, we can move on to the survey question. While we are, while folks are answering that, I do want to answer the question that someone asked earlier about emerald ash borer, and black ash basket makers are very, very concerned about emerald ash borer. There's been quite a bit of funding um, that has come through the Forest Service and through other sources that to help um, people do some research about places that are more vulnerable to, um, to ash borer, the, the potential for salvaged wood, because a lot of, in a lot of cases when, there, when ash borer comes into an area, there are salvage operations done to help stop the spread of the, of the insect. Um, so can salvaged wood be saved and can the material still be used for basketry later on? The answer is yes. Um, it can be actually, if it's kept moist and cool enough, um, the wood could actually be used later. And I'm actually heading to a conference in Maine next week that's all about black ash um, traditions and also response to emerald ash borer among black ash basket makers. So there's, there's quite a bit of interesting work done in that way. Um, if you do look at those documents that Mackenzie sent out to you, there's the one that's called Art from the Forest, has a list of references in the back, and there's a great reference in there about um, black ash baskets and in the face of emerald ash borer um, by Benedict. And uh, let me see here if I can find it. <clears throat> It's called um, Handbook for Black Ash Preservation, Reforestation, and Regeneration by Les Benedict and Richard David. Um, so that's a great um, example of a way that native basket makers um, are, are trying to address that issue. Um, and I had another question um, from, let's see, I addressed a little bit about um, over harvesting, but someone said, for example, ginseng and chaga mushroom gatherers sometimes cut down a birch tree. It's very easy to think no one is here, they don't know what they have, so I will take it. Do you have suggestions on how to interact with landowners? Um, yeah, I, I definitely do, and I think that landowners need to be interacted with. <laughs> um, you know, no one should ever be cutting down a tree on someone else's land without that landowner knowing, um, especially if there's a way that they can get what they need without cutting the tree. So for chaga, um, chaga can certainly be harvested without cutting down a tree. Um, and I think that positive interactions with landowners are absolutely essential um, for so many reasons. I mean, I think in some places it's illegal to cut a tree on someone's land if they haven't given you permission, but it's always just good practice. I mean, I think the same extends to walking on someone's land, hunting on someone's land. Um, usually landowners are really interested in learning more about what is on their property. Um, 
one person I interviewed, Tom Katie, um, who he does own land, but I, would, I just want to say that a lot of NTFP users, the gatherers and the artisans, don't actually own land. They, so they actually rely on other people's property for their material. Um, they, so Tom suggested that artisans volunteer to take landowners on a walk on their, on their land to look for what kinds of interesting things that they might have. And the landowners are usually really responsive to that. Um, and you know, Tom also says that he has given landowner if he's taken basket material from someone's land, he'll give them a basket um, at some point. So I think there's a lot of ways to be to have reciprocity with landowners. Um, question about is a black ash basket made from the bark or the wood? It's made from the growth the, the wood. Um, the annual growth rings are um, pounded, like you saw in that in that image. They're pounded to compress one layer of the wood of the growth ring, and then the more solid layer is actually peeled away and, um, and smoothed out and cut into pieces if necessary and then woven into baskets. So I'm sorry I didn't get, get to talk more about black ash basketry. Um, we were running a little bit short on time, but it's a fascinating um, topic and I think that the, you know, the, the tree definitely has to be cut down for the basketry, the baskets to be made. Okay, Joyce from Minnesota. Um, poisonous mushrooms, can they be used for dye? Can handling them, can, can we handle them safely? Um, I, I don't know if I want to give a definitive answer on that. I think that you'd want to handle them. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about handling mushrooms that are poisonous if you eat them. I think that there, many mushrooms are, you know, will cause some sort of un discomfort, but not necessarily, you know, serious illness or death, um, that they can be handled just fine. There might be some that are the ones that are super toxic. I would look into that somewhere else. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, am I familiar with biogeography? Uh, yeah, it's very, very interesting um, topic and concept, and I think this feeds in with it a lot. Um, where is the seminar in Maine? Is it open to the public? Um, I think that so the, the um, sessions probably are open to the public. It is in, at the University of Maine in Orono. Um, and it's called um, Black Ash Symposium. I can send the link to it to Mackenzie, and maybe she can, um, maybe she can disseminate that to folks. Um, let's see. What's a good way to find artisans who gather these products? I would say farmers markets. I would say ask around. Um, may, sometimes people sell in sort of small um, shops and just more like local level um, sort of tourist souvenir shop kind of places or they might have a sign outside their house. I find that there's, you know, you can't necessarily go online and just Google, you know, black ash basketry because a lot of the real master basket makers, they're not advertising. They're, they're making a few baskets a year and they're, they're selling them at, at really high, you know, prices. Um, they're not necessarily easy to find, but I think once you start looking, um, just ask around in your community, I think is the best way to go. Um, let's see, I have a climbing vine in my forest um, called rattan. It's not the rattan for furniture. Do it? Do you know it and what can I do with it? Um, I don't know it, but I know that people use something called rattan for basket making, um, basket basketry. So. Sorry, I can't help you more on that. And then I would like to offer my land to harvesters. I was wondering how to go about doing this. Perhaps like a pick your own orchard idea. Um, it's a great idea. I think that you, um, I would say to, to try to find some individuals first to communicate with and to connect with. And then those people are probably connected with other artisans and other people in their communities. Um, so instead of, I mean, I, I don't know if I'd go straight from like putting out a sign saying, come, come pick things, um, but starting more on a personal level, and then you'll sort of build that network of trust with an individual, and then there are people that they trust, and, you'll have, and, and I think that's a great idea. Um, so thank you for offering your land. Um, I think that that's a great example for others. Um, and then Nancy, I've died with mushrooms. Take precautions to avoid problems with poisons. Okay, separate pots for dyeing, good ventilation, and work away from food preparation. That's a great great things to think about. Um, I have not actually done that, died with mushrooms myself, so, um, so good things to think about there. 
All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming today, um, and I hope that you will get in touch with me if you have further questions. I'm happy to, to talk with you, and I hope that you can take some of this information and use it in your, um, in your work. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you, Alaire. Um, and if you noticed, uh, actually, Carl Dupolt found the link, so it's in the chat box now. You should be able to see it. Um, so after this, you'll be receiving the slides, um, a recording. I've reattached those resources that Alaire mentioned in the post email. Um, and yeah, if you have any other questions, you can ask me. Um, and I hope you will join us again for our next installment, which I believe is on mushrooms. Yeah. Great. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask you to please disconnect your lines.